<laughs> Bailey's at my feet, trying to get my attention. So you'll probably be hearing her in the background. Hope everybody had a nice Fourth of July holiday if you're in the States. Nice weekend for those across the pond and elsewhere. So I want to talk a little bit about post-holiday trade routines. I get a lot of questions as to how do I treat the market? How do I come back to analysis? How do I deal with the holiday volume that comes in or out of the marketplace? And obviously, most of my audience may or may not be. I don't know the, the demographics and such, but you may not be American. And you may not celebrate the 4th of July. But any holiday that causes like a bank holiday, specifically with the dollar, I like to wait and see how the market digests the break, okay, or the the lower volume that comes into the market just ahead of the holiday, or if there's a abbreviated trading session. I don't really look at that as noteworthy or pressing in terms of the analysis. So on this morning. What I do is I go through, I look at the charts, and I see what did we do last week? How did we close last week? And then I look at any kind of headlines that came out over the weekend. Was there anything geopolitical? Was there anything that would have been unexpected, you know, war-related, that type of thing? Terrorist attacks, ICT opening up on Mellor mentorship for, fun, for funds and payment, which I'm not. <laughs> Conspiracies. So the uh, looking for a rhyme or reason as to why the market should do a specific thing. And obviously we know that the dollar index had a nice big run up overnight. And we've been bullish on dollar. That means it is risk off. So risk off means that other asset classes, other markets, are going to have pressure placed on them, not selling pressure, but pressure in the sense that sentiment will evaporate for bullishness. Case in point, euro dollar. Case in point, British pound versus US dollar. And if we see a market that kind of fades that underlying tone, and what, what does that mean? Well, consider stock index futures. Now, the market has traded up. We rallied after an SMT divergence at the lows compared to the NASDAQ and E-mini S&P. You'll see that the initial drops lower. We had a failure to go lower in NASDAQ. That is my SMT divergence. So when I was asked this morning if I was going to be trading, uh, my interest was predominantly in the PM session. But I'm always watching to see what is likely to occur. Does the morning session give me reasons to justify why I want to stay on the sidelines until PM session, or does it create some kind of a specialty condition, some kind of circumstance or setup that would otherwise trip other traders up, you know, the retail traders, the, the street money. What are they going to be expecting? What are they looking for? And I kind of weigh that out with my expectations on what I believe the market's going to try to do. Now, it doesn't mean I'm always right. Obviously, you've seen a few times where I've been wrong. But there are times where if I'm sitting on the sidelines, if I'm waiting for a particular condition to occur or form in the afternoon, you're probably asking, well, what is it you're trying to avoid them from for? What was the initial apprehension? What was the cause for me to not want to be so interested in the morning initially? Well, it's because we had that big run up in dollar and that is a risk off scenario. So again, so for the folks that have answered incorrectly when I asked on Twitter, if the dollar is going higher like that, is that risk on or risk off? It is risk off. That means they're not willing to trade in foreign assets. So they run to flight to quality. <laughs> now, I'm not going to defend the dollar in terms of being quality, okay? But it's considered a safe haven. And I'm not going to try to defend that stance either, but that's commonly referred to as the flight to quality or safe haven. 
So if there's uncertainty, if there is no interest in taking on risk, and that would be in the form of buying euro, buying pound, buying equities, that type of thing, that is being risk on. So you're willing to assume that risk. And when that occurs, that's when you'll see the dollar tend to trade lower, or it could be held in consolidation while other asset classes rally. That's still a risk on scenario. It's not as strong as when we see dollar going lower and foreign currencies and equities going higher. That's definitely risk on. That's a strong risk on environment. But if we have an indication that we're likely to go lower on a particular market, whether it be a Forex pair or an index futures, and if we see a very strong dollar, like it's performed overnight, and my private mentorship, high five, our objective, it's traded into our premium array and the mo the morning opening on equities if you look at what has transpired so far in nasdaq and e-mini s p it started going lower drifting a little bit lower and but then it didn't quite get down to that 3740 did it got real close to it and then it created an s t divergence and then what does it do it starts to rally higher that is the very thing I try to avoid in the morning sessions for that very reason, because it can go against the grain a little bit. It can lead people astray. I've fallen victim to that stuff before, and I've learned this as a reason for me to have rules of engagement, things that would limit my engagement or at least frame it in the context where at least I know what I'm doing and why I'm not doing something. And if you don't have those things built into your model, you really don't know what you're doing, much like a stop loss. If you don't use a stop loss, you don't know what you're doing. I don't care if you're saying that you're profitable and you have a broker statement that says, look at this, I've made X, Y, Z percent in the last two weeks, three months, whatever. Playing that game will eventually burn you. So you have to have a stop loss. You have to have rules to know when you're not going to be doing something. And it doesn't matter who agrees with it. It's your business you're running. Do you think Amazon cares what everybody else's opinion about how they do their thing? There's a lot of people that are very opinionated about how Amazon runs as a company. They don't pay their people enough. They don't do this. They don't pay enough to offshore, whatever. They're not concerned about it. So you shouldn't be concerned about anybody else having their opinion about how you should be trading your business. Stay in your lane. Let them worry about themselves because I can tell you this. I've discovered the majority of the people on the internet that have a high opinion about other people or low opinion about other people, they generally are freed up with a lot of time because they're not actually trading themselves. So if you see these talking heads out there, they're very opinionated about you or someone you're following, it kind of begs the question, if they're so interested in me or you or what you're doing, what are they doing in their own trading? They're not minding their own business. They're not minding their own craft. So that would, in my mind, indicate that they have no idea what they're doing in their own funds. They're not making money. They're not counting their own stacks. So they're what? You're, they're trying to mind your business. So you have to have rules so that way you stay in your own lane and you don't worry about anybody else. You don't care about what I make. You don't care about what anybody else makes or loses. It's irrelevant because you're not going to spend my money. You're not going to feel the pain and suffering. If I take a loss, so why bother with it? And don't invite other people to do that in your own trading either, because they're not going to be sympathetic to you. They may appear on face value. Believe me, they're down. Deep. They're loving the fact that you're suffering just like they are. Although yours might be a very momentary drawdown or a stop loss being hit and you have a, a losing trade. The high opinionated people, they generally aren't profitable. And they're usually the ones that are very critical of other people, not just one person or one teacher or guru, but these ideas permeate this industry because 90% plus fail to be profitable. So it's easy for them to look for an outlet to discharge themselves. So to prevent yourself from having all those pitfalls where you feel like you got to do those types of things, start being critical of other people or yourself in your own journal, which you shouldn't do. You have to have rules. You have to have limitations. You have to have some kind of structure as to why and when 
you do or do not engage in price. Now, back to the discussion with the index future. If you compare the NASDAQ with the E-mini S&P, as I mentioned, you can see that the NASDAQ failed to make lower lows as S&P did. And then we had a little bit of a lift. And then S&P rallied, NASDAQ rallied, and created a short-term premium. And the market traded above its short-term highs, cleared out buy-side liquidity, and we have since drifted a little bit lower. Now, did it go higher to a premium to go lower? Yes. Has it gone to 37.40 yet? No. Is there opportunity in here or was there? Yes. Is the price action clean? No. So contrast what you're seeing in the index features this morning versus other market days where we're looking for a particular level, a draw on liquidity above or below, and the market just delivers a very nice little break in, <laughs> break in structure and then return back to a fair value gap. And then it runs off and chases to the liquidity pool that we're looking for. That's a clean market. That's a symmetrical market. We're not having that because we're coming off the heels of what? A holiday. And we had a big overnight run in dollars. So what's actually happening is the market's being allowed to digest and develop market sentiment. That's what's occurring. Okay, so because that sentiment is evolving, now I'm not saying that the sentiment that dollar went bullish like it did last night is the continuation of that very effect. In other words, I'm not suggesting this just because we had a big up day overnight in dollar, that means it's going to continue higher because obviously it can be rejected today or going into tomorrow. What I'm saying is because of the holiday, because we came off of a weekend, yes, we had abbreviated trading yesterday, but I don't look at that as, again, noteworthy. I could care less what it did yesterday. I treat it like it didn't happen. So I'm looking at Friday's data. I'm not even concerned with what we did on an abbreviated session on 4th of July. Now, some of you may be hissing and saying, what? What a noob. <laughs> well, you do what you want. Okay, I'm going to do what I believe serves me best. OK, and everybody's going to have a different opinion about what's. And I'm not subscribing to other people to learn how to trade. I'm not looking at other people to get a better feel for what I should do as a trader. But to the audience members that come here or my YouTube channel and they want to at least look into what it is that I do, whether they want to subscribe to the ideas or not, I make that available to those that are inclining their ear to it. It doesn't mean you should. It just means that I'm answering the call for those individuals to have asked, what do I do after holidays? How do I treat the market? The other reason why I'm posted, well, I posted on Twitter that I'm more interested in the PM session this morning because we have non-farm payroll this Friday. And I know a lot of folks that have been trading for a while, they see me make that remark or, or they hear me make that remark and they're like, Dude, why is he not wanting to trade non-farm payroll? There's opportunity. There's opportunity every single day. There's all the time. But your opportunity doesn't necessarily mean it's my opportunity. And vice versa, if my opportunity may be perfect for me, may not necessarily be the opportunity for you, even as my student. So that's why it's important for you to bring your own individual, unique personality into this. Because if you don't do that, if you fail to do that, you're going to be frustrated because you're trying to align yourself with the person you're trying to copy. And you don't know what I'm thinking. You don't know what concerns I have. You don't have the time constraints that keeps me from staying with a trade because maybe I'm getting ready to go on a vacation. Or maybe my wife said, you spent too much time in front of these charts and you owe me some time. Or my kids say, hey, you know, this is what it's going to be like, dad. We got things to do. Or something else that's unexpected comes up. So... It's important for you to have about what it is that you're trying to do as a unique, individual, independent thinker. It's fine that you're learning from me or anyone else that's profitable and consistent and has a sound logic, but you still have to, at some point, make it your own. And there's nothing inherently wrong about that. You're not trying to reinvent the wheel. You're not trying to repackage the person. Now, I don't view it as someone repackaging 
what I teach. I don't like it when they rename things and try to sell it. That's obvious then. But for you to learn from me and then say, okay, he taught this, 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 but he didn't put it in this order or refer to it on this time frame in this type of condition and this economic climate with the calendar. But I see this repeating over and over and over again. So should I ignore that because he didn't mention it as my mentor or because I see something going on there? Should I log that and continuously in that to see if it's going to be something fruitful? If you do the latter, you're cheating yourself of your own individual model that brings in your own personal personality, and that's making it your own. I mentioned a, a comment, uh, I think the last stream or Twitter live thing, whatever you call it here, spaces. I made a remark that I could make a model every single week the rest of my life, and it'd be different. And that wasn't an exaggeration. I got somebody sent me an email. Says, Why did you say something like that? You know, that's not possible. It is possible. How many time frames are there? <laughs> it's you know, all kinds of different time frames. You can do three minute charts, minute chart, you know, 27 second chart. You, you're not limited. And your framework, what makes sense to you and the logic behind those things, but you, they may not be critical to me. They may not be critical to everyone else in the social circle that you're in too. That's why I frown upon groups. Okay. I see a lot of folks coming to my comment section or they reply to my tweets and they what they're trying to do is they're trying to drum up an audience okay they're trying to get people to come together to congregate and then they're going to come in and pitch ICT mentorship videos how price what I'm telling you don't waste your money folks you have no idea what I'm teaching yet don't buy from these goobers trust me okay trust me look what I've already given away I'm going to amplify what I've already given away we're getting ready. We're going to be making ends meet. And you're going to have some PDF study guides and everything starting this weekend. But it's going to be based on building rules. Rules of engagement. When not to engage. And because they have an account calendar with the non-farm payroll this week, I don't like non-farm payroll. Have I made money on non-farm payroll with real live trading? Yes. Have I lost a lot of money on non-farm payroll with real life trading? Yes. <laughs> the latter is more likely to occur and has been in the past over my career. So doesn't it make sense if I know that's an area where I'm prone to do it wrong? What did he say? <gasps> this can't be ICT. ICT is too arrogant. He would never say something like that. No. I have found that most of my losses occur in certain times of the month where the economic calendar broadcasts it beforehand. And because I was falling victim to everybody else on, at the time, message boards on American Online. Oh, man, I'm, I killed it in non-farm payroll. Okay, I didn't see them trade it, but I just read what they said they made. Well, that means I'm missing out. Let me go here. And every single time, I would regret it. And it would be less money in my account as a result. So I came to the conclusion that these people are full of shit. And I didn't watch them trade. They didn't even show me a broker statement. They just said they made this. And I later on that this is actually them to themselves and everyone else that would lend their ear or read their crap. Because they want to be coddled. They want to be nudged like, wow, you, you must really know what you're doing. And then they mentally, because they really blew their shit. They lost their money. And now they're going to act like they got it all figured out when they really don't. And that's why this industry sucks in a lot of ways, because there's a lot of fakes. And they may not come out with the intent to be a fake or a fraud or trying to scam anyone. They may not even be selling anything. But if you take the time to listen to other people, and they're usually the braggarts, the people that don't really have anything to show for what they're saying, but they're really critical of other people too. They aren't profitable. They're not making money. Because believe me, folks, if people are making money in this day and age, believe me, they're going to shove it down your throat. They're going to prove it even when you're not asking for it. And when you said you've seen enough, they're going to still shove it down your throat. Think about it. This whole world right now, look what you're listening to. You're listening to me right now pontificate about 
things that probably you don't feel are useful to you. But they really are. Do you have a filter? Are you filtering out all these people that like to get on the internet, on Twitter, and do things and say things that they can't really back up with any evidence that those things took place? And that's how I fell victim to non-farm payroll. I listened to other people bloviate about how much they made. Maybe they made a profitable trade later in the day, but if six trades and the previous five were losing trades, we're only talking about how they made money on that one trade and their net loss for the day isn't really being talked about. Is that genuine? No. But that's them putting on that mental band-aid. That's what social media has done. It's allowed people to put social band-aids on their character flaws, they virtue signal. Oh, look at me. I'm doing this for the for the poor. Look at this. I'm giving I'm gonna give a helping hands ministry to people that can't afford this and that. Well, if you're doing that, there's your reward. I don't get on here and talk about what I do for other people because I don't want that reward. I don't want that virtue placed on me because I say I've done something. The people I help, they know I helped them, and I don't want to be glad hand about it. And the same thing about my trading. I want my students, my genuine students, to come here or on YouTube with a pen and pad, with a sincere desire to want to learn, and lay down all your mental baggage. That means the stuff you're bringing in that's toxic, and also what your previous educators taught you. Put all that stuff down. You can, you can pick it up later on, but if you try to blend all that stuff, like white off and supply and demand and Elliott wave and harmonics and this and that and the other thing. All that stuff is going to make it harder for you to learn what it is I'm teaching. Because what I'm teaching is very easy. But the complication is you have to get out of your own way. And one of the to get myself out of my own way was make very rigid rules around how I'm going to conduct myself in the marketplace. When am I allowed to do anything? And Here's the hard time. When am I not allowed to do anything? Think about it. The sign says, don't step on the grass. Don't touch wet paint. What are you going to do? <laughs> you're going to moonwalk across the lawn. And then you're going to put your initials in fresh paint. ICT was here. 2022. Bite me. <laughs> I did stupid stuff like that when I was younger. I'm not proud of it, but that's human nature. Tell me I can't do something, and I'm going to start thinking about 20 ways I can do it and not get caught doing it. And then feel like I've done something good when it's not good. That's human nature. That's human nature. All of us have that. That's inherent in all of us. A child is not taught how to be a misbehaving little being. It just knows it by nature. Well, in trading... All of us are like children. Yeah. That means what? We can tend to do things to get ourselves in harm's way. And you have to have boundaries. You have to set them as the analyst. Because if you don't do that as the analyst, the trader in you is going to listen to the gambler. Just like it did when I was on America Online. Not on payroll, man. It's going to move around. It's going to do this. It's going to do that. And if you buy this package here, it'll send you a signal. And if it's a red box, that means you sell it. And if it's a green box, you buy it. You know what the news is going to do. We know what the numbers are going to do. Man, I, I wasted money doing that. I was among a lot of other people that did that kind of crap. All these systems that said, before the news comes out, we're going to give you this. And as soon as the news comes out, it's going to give you a red or a green box. Well, first of all, you're sitting there and you're waiting for red or green. Think about how that works when you're at a red light <laughs> in your automobile. Are you really looking both ways and see if these oncoming traffic has really stopped on their end before your green light becomes green? Chances are you probably don't do it. I know I have to yell at my wife all the time. And yes, I do yell at my wife when she's driving because she's not that safe as a driver. And I don't feel comfortable riding in shotgun with her. 
And one of the things that she does is she waits for the light to turn green and starts moving. But there's people that just generally think they can get through that light. And that's a lot of what we do as traders when we don't have limitations. Just because you have time to be in front of charts, just because you have margin in your account, just because these candlesticks are painting and you have time to be in front of the next session doesn't mean that this is the safest thing for you to do. Or, for instance, look at your chart right now on an E-mini S&P. Now, probably not as practical for people that are listening to this later on, but it's basically consolidating right now. It had a little bit of a rally up after the opening at 9.30, and we started drifting lower, and now we're consolidating. Okay. There are people out there that can't wait to get in based on the last five candles that's just printed because they feel like they're going to do what? Miss something. I don't feel like I'm missing anything because we have non-farm payroll conditions. And generally, for those that have been keeping up and for those that have not really listened to this before or heard me say it, the way I teach my students is on non-farm payroll weeks, what is that? It's when the employment number comes out, usually the first Friday of every trade month. And that will give you the employment number. I don't care about the data. And whenever these reports come out, when I'm looking at high impact or medium impact news drivers, I don't care what the data says. I don't care. First of all, if I cared about it, think about what you're expecting. You're going to wait for the numbers to be released, then open up the data and start reading it. Is the market sitting still while you're doing that? Hell no, it ain't doing that. It's not doing it. And my belief is it's already priced in to the market. And then what they're going to do is they're going to use that as sentiment. And people many times will get caught off guard. Not all the time, but in my experience, I've seen many times where the data suggests that it should go higher for that particular market or it would be considered beneficial for the currency. Okay, that's how like Forex Factory would say something like that. And it goes the other direction. <laughs> so that was one of the reasons why I stop trying to decipher all the quote-unquote fundamental data that i don't think that's fundamental that's hindsight because all those data points they've been known about they've been known about by more intelligent more vested individuals entities that really have a lot more money in this game than you and i collectively will ever and because of that they're greedy and they'll pay for information and they'll want to be positioned ahead of time and start fading these types of moves because once it gets into the public's hands and eyes, it's already done. Like it's done. What are you expecting to happen? So it's not the same as if a you know, headline comes out, so-and-so country was just bombed, God forbid, in a, a nuclear fashion. Man, that's going to cause the markets to go nuts. You can't you can't expect that. You can't know how to decipher what that's going to do for a marketplace. It's going to be crazy. And that's like a black swan event. Every individual event that's high impact or medium impact event, I treat that as that very thing, just on a very smaller scale. In other words, I'm expecting volatility to be injected into the marketplace. Something happens by that data being released and the market is either organically or artificially manipulated. And what does that mean? Well, the algorithm is going to do what it normally does or manual intervention comes in and they will reprice to a specific level. And it usually is immediate, kind of like an interest rate announcement coming out by FOMC, something like that. If the Fed comes out or another country comes out and says, okay, uh, we're going to cut interest rates you know, by a full basis point, something unexpected. You know, boom, they reprice immediately. That's not buying and selling pressure. That's at, at central bank level. They're saying it's our currency. It's our commodity. It's our product. It's our good. And guess what? Who sets the price? We do. And we don't care if you're long or short and too bad. Pound sand. Those types of events, you can't really predict. So what I like to do is wait for the news to hit the market and then basically go in the price and see if there is something that would be manipulated to match my narrative. 
my bias, my trading model. If those, th if those three things agree and the event has now been introduced to the marketplace, that being volatility based on the data that's being released by that report, then I'll go in and look to engage. But on days after holidays, and if it's like it is here, we had 4th of July in the U.S., it's a holiday in the U.S., the dollar-based. And, you know, people out there doing what? They're cooking hot dogs and hamburgers, sewing, getting sunburns, you know, doing things that you probably shouldn't be doing, <laughs> having fun doing it. They're not trading. But the day after that, when we put our thinking cats back on, maybe you are a little hungover. Maybe you're a little tired. Maybe you're not really focused in on what's going on. And then you add to it that we have a non-farm payroll week where I teach my students on those particular weeks on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday by 7 a.m. You either have your trade on or you don't. And you stay on the sidelines the rest of the week. <sighs> Come on, ICT. That's not fun. I could still find trades on Wednesday. You can. You can. I'm not. There's lots of moves I missed doing this. Lots of really big moves. I'm not oblivious to that. But I've also been saved by a lot of noisy, choppy price action. And I want to be where it's likely to materialize in, in the scope that it's high probability. There's market symmetry there. Everything's lined up. Everything's in agreement. Dollars up. Everything else is going down. I'm going short euro dollar. And I have correlated pair SMT divergence supporting the fact that I'm in the weaker of the two between cable and fiber. So that means euro dollars fail to make a higher high. And then it's going lower, more likely to go lower than cable, which is pound dollar. So all those things, that's a symmetrical market to me. It's high probability. All things, all factors considered, that's high probability. But I will never frame the day after a holiday as high probability ever, ever, because that market is ripe to be manipulated on a manual basis. That means someone can come in and do something that you won't expect. And I don't want to be able to look back and say, well, I usually lose money in that situation. And I took the chance today and I lost again. I wish I would have learned my lesson. I, I don't want to have that again. So what I like to do is look at the marketplace, respect the risk, come up with an idea, an opinion, and see if it pans out. And then when it doesn't pan out, in my journal, those entries are like this. This is one more instance where I'm glad I have these rules of engagement that keeps me from participating in the marketplace because I expected this and the model didn't materialize. This is what took it. Had I not followed my rules, I would have suffered a monetary loss with this idea. Now, am I critiquing myself? Yes. Am I being negative about it? No. I'm re-emphasizing the fact that I've done things correctly, but also recording the fact that if I was to follow the model or a model, and I have lots of models, but if I followed a model that I had in mind beforehand, when I've already adopted the mindset based on rules of engagement, things that I have to know when I'm going to do something, when I can't do something, days after holidays, I am likely to sit still. But I'd like to obviously engage on the mental side of trading. It doesn't mean I'm going and pushing a, a live account, but I'm usually going in sometimes with a demo. Sometimes I'm making a, a, a comment to my sons. I'll say, look, this is what dad thinks is going to happen. And let's see what happens. They love telling me when I got it wrong, much like some of the people out there on YouTube and Twitter, <laughs> they live for that. But when I get it wrong, I sit down with them and I say, look, this is what dad was expecting. And this is what took place. And this is the reason why dad or ICT doesn't want to do these on these types of days, because I'm more apt to be incorrect. So again, if you know you're likely to have your arm tore off, walking down three streets to the right from where you live and there's a white picket fence and there's a Rottweiler over there. And every time you walked by there, this dog's taking something from you, whether it be clothing, flesh, something. 
How many times are you going to keep walking down there before you realize it's probably not the best path for you to end up where you're trying to get in one piece? Now, I don't know where you're from, but I don't need to have decades of that type of experience before I learn my lesson. It took me a couple of years, <laughs> painfully, but it took me time and pain and loss to come up with these ideas where I'm not going to engage. And I don't care what anybody else thinks about it. I don't care how anybody else views it, because most of the time people are going to be judgmental to you. They'll be judgmental to me and they have no idea how I trade. They don't even know what it is I'm teaching you. They look at something and because they want to make a name for themselves or they want to feel better about themselves, they'll critique something and it's usually by ignorance and they look like a fool. Don't take other people's opinion about you not wanting to engage the market as something that should influence you. Laugh at them because they're, they're raising of importance, their self-awareness about themselves. And they equate that, that you should view them as someone to listen to when they've brought nothing to the table as the reason why they should be listened to. And you're not going to get someone to listen to you if you start poking at them saying, you've done this, you've done this wrong, you do this wrong. You, okay, show me by contrast what it is that I should be doing. These jokers don't do that. So when I sit down with you and I lecture you, I'm telling you, I've learned these lessons through pain, <laughs> okay? I didn't learn them from books. I learned these from pain. I learned them from taking an account placing it into risk in that environment, fleecing me, taking from me, not on one time occasion, not on just a handful of occasions, but many instances where many times it equated to me having an account that was blown. I have no reason to hide that. That's the whole reason why I'm teaching the way I teach. I have suffered those things. So wasn't it natural for you to learn from somebody that has made mistakes before and other things? Sure. What did they do to hurt themselves? What did they do to help themselves learn better, quicker, without having all these pitfalls and these snares? That's what you want. That's a mentor, someone that has gone through things and understands, okay, that's a problem area. And if you don't do these things and put these controls in place, you're likely to repeat that same thing in the future. If they are not equipped to see that and come up with a, a mitigation to it, some kind of, well, like I mentioned, mechanism. That means a filter, something that says you are not allowed to trade. You are not allowed to participate. You have to have those things. Think about it, folks. If, if you don't drink and drive and you stay on your side of the road and you don't speed, about 85% of the time, you're not going to have a car accident and the people around you aren't going to have a car accident either. But sometimes there's individuals that say those are, those rules don't apply to them. Well, it's the same thing with trading without a stop loss. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> yeah. That does, folks. Listen to me, okay? And I know there's people in here that are teaching other people, even have YouTube channels, and they don't use stop losses, and they try to justify why they don't use a stop loss. There is no justification for it. Zero. Learn how to mitigate risk, risk then go back to teaching. Because if you're not using a stop loss, you are gambling. And the only thing you're teaching other people is, guess what? You're Nostradamus. You, you know what the market's going to do. Think about it. If you're saying that you don't need to put a stop loss in because you know where you're going to get out when your trade's wrong, what happens when it reprices aggressively? And you didn't expect that repricing occur so aggressively. And it moves way beyond what your safe exit point would have been or what you're willing to lose. You're crushed. And if anybody's watched you trade that way, which conveniently they never let anyone see that, those individuals are learning to do that very thing in their own trading. Now, is that, in my opinion, and I think you would agree too, is that right kind of leadership and or mentor or teacher when it comes to risking money? I would humbly submit no. Because what they're doing is trading by itself is already in heavy. And you have to have a way to control yourself. You have to control how much you risk. 
your leverage, the, the amount of money per trade, how much of a stop loss you're going to allow in terms of points or pips. You have to place a limit on that. What days of the week are you going to trade? Are you going to trade any old time? I teach what? A kill zone. And it we're shortened. We want to see it go up first. That's what institutional traders do. They have mechanisms. They have to wait for the market to have an uptick before they can go short. So I adopted that with my perspective and price. I need to see what first. It needs to go higher. Okay, so where does it need to go to? Above some measure of equilibrium. So I'm having all these rules and these control mechanisms placed in my logic because it's an algorithm that's pricing these markets and it's booking them. And they have what? Control mechanisms, filters. So I'm aligning myself with an algorithmic principle oriented trading model. But if you are teaching or if you're learning from someone that's not using a stop loss and preaches, they don't need to use a stop loss because they know where they're going to get out. What they're saying is, is they know what the market's going to do. Absolutely. So therefore they don't need a stop loss. That is the definition of arrogance. I am not arrogant. I'm confident, probably sometimes too blisteringly confident for some, but I do have limitations. And to teach or to illustrate trading without a stop loss, there is no other way to say it, folks. This is the way it is. Those individuals that are doing that are saying they know what the market's going to do. Now, they may say it and believe it, but that's not true. I don't know what the market's going to do. I have to use a stop loss. I know it's likely to do this or that, but I have to use a stop loss. Why? Because I'm human. I may have done something wrong. I may have shirked a rule of engagement, bent the rules a little bit. I've done that in the past. I'm human. Sometimes I think, uh, yeah, this looks like it's trying to do this. I want to do that, but it looks like it's doing this. And I'll just toss in something small. But I'm using a stop loss. Why? Because I don't know what the manual side of intervention is going to do. And nobody knows that. That's the risk that is always in the offing. You have to have that aware, that, that, that awareness of that potentially harming you. And if you're learning from someone or if you're trying to do this without using a stop loss, what you're saying is you have no boundaries. That means whatever the market wants to do to you, you're inviting it. Now, there are times when manual intervention comes in and a major repricing in the market asset takes place and your stop loss necessarily will be of no protection to you. And what does that mean? You might have a 20 handle stop loss on your index futures trade. Now I'm not arguing or making the case that 20 handles is the appropriate size, but let's just say for the discussion here, say you have 20 points. Okay. And the market has some kind of major announcement comes out or someone gets bombed. Boom, the market just gaps. 40 handles. Think you can't do that? Stick around because you're going to see stuff like that real soon. But what happens with your stop loss? Does the market and the broker say, hey, Jane had her stop loss at 42.50. Okay. But it gapped 43.10. Oh, I can't move like that. <laughs> Either direction, it can do that. No problem, given the right circumstance. They're not going to go back and say, okay, um, Jane's stop was at 50, so we're going to honor that and get her out, and we're going to mark to market in her case on that understanding. They're not going to do that, folks. They're not going to do it. So, yes, you need a stop loss. Yes, sometimes your stop loss doesn't give you the protection that you hold true that it would likely give you. That's the underlying risk. That's why this is not meant for everyone. And for some of you, you're probably thinking, man, this is something I don't, I didn't really think about this. I don't think I can do this. Guess what? That's probably true. And maybe I've saved you a lot of hardship and monetary loss because you probably wouldn't learn until you lost a lot of money that you probably can't do this. But for those individuals that know that you've been bitten by the bug and you're not going to take no for an answer, you have to use a stop loss.
because it's a rule of engagement. You have to have it. You don't know what that market's going to do. You don't know how far they're going to take it against your idea. And believe me, when I was a 20-year-old, I arm wrestled. And I would pretend I was using a stop loss. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm, if it goes down here, I'm going to get out of that. And then all of a sudden, it would start going towards it. And I'd say, okay, well, really, you know, I'm willing to take a little bit bigger risk. You know, I'll, I'll sit through 10 more cents and, and moving soybeans against me more than I would have. And the stop loss is not in the market yet. It's this open. I have a target I'm trying to get to, but I don't have a stop loss in it. If you want to push it in, because that's what you're essentially doing. And that may sound crude, but that's exactly what it is. If you give the market the opportunity to abuse you, it will gladly do so repeatedly. Don't believe it? Lose and go back in again. Lose and go back in again. It's not going to feel sorry for you. It's not going to feel sorry that you didn't put a stop loss in and limit the amount of money that you're going to lose or could have lost. It's going to punish you. That's what it's there for. It's not here for your entertainment. It's not here for you to get better in terms of financial living. It's not for you. This is war. And you have to treat it as such. When people go out to battle nation against nation, are they walking out there with wife beaters on and shorts and flip flops? Hell no. <laughs> They're going out there with helmets. Plates, they're trying to get behind barriers like tanks and things that fortify themselves from, you know, enemy fire. Because there's a risk. So if you're out there trying to do things and you don't have control me mechanisms and, and measures in place, when should you do something? When shouldn't you do something? It applies to a stop loss. I'm willing to take a loss if it goes here. But if it goes here and beyond, I'm probably wrong. That's what everybody without a stop loss is avoiding. That notion of being wrong. And being wrong, folks, you got to warm up to the idea. That's the best thing to know in this industry. Are you wrong? Are you wrong about your idea or your outlook on the marketplace? Because if you are wrong, you're going to want to know it because you're not going to keep throwing good money after bad. And as a young man at 20 years old, I didn't know that. I learned it painfully and very expensively, but I did learn it. Those and these are the discussions that none of the young hotshots that want to come here teach me an order block. Teach me an order block. Just give me the bias. Those individuals, and you know who you are listening, you're never going to learn how to do this as long as you hold on to those mindsets and think that's all it is. There is so much more that's going to be in your way. And you have not been here long enough, not under me, but in the markets long enough to discern where these things are going to creep up into your development, your trading. And everybody endures it. You're not going to be the guy or gal that just tap dances around these barriers, these pitfalls, these snares. You're going to put your head in the noose just like everybody else does and hang themselves. But I'm telling you, you don't have to do those things to learn the lesson. Learn from my mistakes. Learn from the fact that I lost fortunes doing stupid stuff. Stupid things. And it's not shameful for me to admit these things. I would want to learn from someone that's open and honest. This is how I screwed up in the past. And I lost lots of money. And I believe these things that are out there, they're still being promoted by books and authors and things. And it's garbage. Because they only talk about, this is what you can make. This is the pattern that works. And they fixate on those positive outcomes. And not nearly enough on the things that are going to hurt you. That's the reality. You're going to lose money. Even trading with what I teach, you're going to lose money. Are you going to keep losing money in the same trading day, in the same environment that you keep losing previous weeks and previous months? Most of you probably won't endure that because your money management is lacking and you'll blow out before that even becomes an issue. Suddenly, some of you are thinking to yourself, wow, this trading thing is a little bit more involved than I thought. Exactly. It's very easy to do, but it's next to impossible to accomplish profitably. Because you get in your own way, 
You don't have boundaries. You don't have limitations on what you can and can't do. And you expose yourself to risks, limitless risks. Without a stop loss, you're saying take everything in my account and more. And given that opportunity, it can and will. I have seen that <laughs> firsthand. I know that intimately. That's a feeling you don't want to ever have. And I can tell you, in those instances where I was a 20-year-old and I knew that was going to be the outcome, I still wouldn't close the trade. Think about it. I'm in an account. That account maybe had seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars in it, twenty thousand dollars in it, and I'm in a position, and I'm holding on to it, holding on to it. Live cattle. It's going to move. It's going to move. Yeah, it's moving against me, and it's way beyond what I've been thinking is this is the area I would like to get out that goes down here, but I don't want to be wrong. I don't want to be wrong, man. Come on. I need a winner. And if I can come back from this, this is like the underdog story. This thing went against me so far and I still came out. Well, I came out. <laughs> I came out of that trading day with a blown account. So you have to have patience. You have to say, Regardless of what anybody else thinks about me, regardless of whatever my mentor might suggest, I have to have my own limitations. These are the rules that I have to adhere to. That's it. He teaches 1% risk, but I can't. I got to do one quarter of 1% because I, I just can't. I can't tolerate it. I got I to gotta use that little bit of money to do it. That's the right way of doing it. If I or anybody else says, this is the minimum threshold that you should reach in terms of managing and, well, managing risk, it's always there. But if you take that one degree or more beyond what the educator like myself or anyone else that's teaching sound money management and risk management, and you make it even more limited, that's actually a good thing. And some of you are like, oh, well, you can't get rich. I can't make a lot of money risking one quarter of 1%. You don't know math. <laughs> Anybody that says you can't get rich risking one quarter of 1% failed rudimentary math. Period. Because you can do a whole hell of a lot risking one quarter of 1% if you know what you're doing. But the problem is you failed rudimentary math. That's the first problem. Two, you don't know how to trade. You don't know how to trade because you don't know that these patterns repeat multiple times inside of one week. How many weeks are in a month? Generally four or more. How many months are in a year? Twelve. How long do you plan on being on this spinning rock? It's uncertain. But as long as you have mental faculties and health to do so and equity, you probably want to keep trading, right? So all that is potential opportunity. But you, you right now listening, are probably looking at every single individual transaction, every trade. This is the make it and break it. This is the be all end all. This has to work or I'm done. Why? Why did you just make this a summer blockbuster plot where you have to absolutely conquer the biggest boss of the most villainous organization on the planet even the x-men wouldn't even mess with this person okay that's what you turn this trade into <laughs> it sounds silly when you think about because that's exactly what you've been doing you've turned it into an olympic feat well it's just a simple trade but you're trading with such a high degree of leverage in an environment where it's not likely to work in your favor but you just had to push a button Now, you're looking for the theme track to Interstellar. <laughs> John, I'm going to figure out the problems of the universe, and I'm going to beat this trade. I mean, come on, man. You're doing too much. It's either you're buying it, it's going to go higher and you get out, or you're shorting it, and you're getting out lower price. If the market's not providing you an atmosphere or environment that provides it in a way where it's symmetrical, all things being equal, risk on, risk off, liquidity's obvious, the market's moving very nice. 
clean price levels. It means it creates imbalances, it comes back rebalances, and then starts to expand in the direction you want to see it. Order flow is working in your favor. All those things are firing on all cylinders. That's the environment you want to be trading in. And that's what I teach you how to identify. But I'm also teaching you, and some of you are kicking and screaming, you don't want to learn the lessons when to stay out. Because guess what? That's being told you can't do something by dad. A lot of you have daddy issues. You don't want to be told when you can and can't do something. Don't try to trade with a two-pip stop loss. Because you see other people saying they can do it. Listen, I can. Doesn't mean I do. Do you hear that? I can, but it doesn't mean I do. Just because you see somebody else do something, that means that they've said they've done something already. It's hindsight. They've done something. That's not an invitation for you to try to replicate that. The circumstances that caused that invent, even if they did make money, you can't go back in time and do that with them. And you can't take every instance of when someone else said something, just like with my lessons and my teachings. They're going to be fractal. They look similar. But they're not exactly identical. And some of you, like my uncle was, he's very finite. He, it has to be black or white. It has to be this or that. And it can't be close to it, but still worth taking a shot and using a stop loss and, and see what happens. If you're too analytical, two things have to be in the fine print exactly this way each time. You are going to struggle. And there's no shorter way of saying it and more direct. You are going to struggle. The market's not going to bend to make it easier for you. You're going to have to endure and learn that you have to trade in the you have to trade in the gray, where it looks like something you've seen before, but because it could be wrong, and you, as the operator, as the trader, following the analyst, you have to incur that risk, and you have to keep at bay the gambler that says, "Come on, man." Don't listen to this guy, man. Look, you see the chart. You've done 14 other trades where he wasn't even looking at that pair. And you made money. Don't listen to ICT about everything. Trust your gut. Well, this is one instance where you don't trust your gut and you should be listening to me. I'm talking to the analyst in you, not the trader. This is the brain trust inside of you. This is the person that you're going to place all your trust in. Not me. Not your friends in some chat room. You, the person that's really going to push that button to get in and get out, the person that's really going to put the stop loss on and not pretend that I know where I want to get out. There's a lot of trades I wish I would have got out where I wanted to get out and it didn't give me the opportunity to do it. It just rolled right over top of it and kept on running. You have to have. Well. Flexibility in yourself, your expert in your own performance. But that is also going to have to incorporate hard rules. I cannot take a day when circumstances are like this. What is that? The day after a bank holiday, a day after a long weekend. Those things are, man, they're snares. There's going to be some days where they just really rip and tear off, and it's just wonderful to be a part of those moves. But they're not always like that. They're more likely to not be like that. So is that high probability conditions? No, at least not by my definition isn't. And I know some of you in here don't like to define things as high probability based on the things I say are high probability because you've done something and you maybe done something and you made profits with a real account because you shouldn't be trading with real money yet. You're still learning, but some of you just want to be doing it. Now, be honest. No one else can hear your thoughts. When you know you shouldn't be doing something and you made money, do you really feel good about it? No. That's the reason why you go on social media and talk about how you made money. You're dealing with the guilt because you knew that that was not skill. That was plain old luck. I believe in luck. I don't believe my results are a result of luck. <laughs> I believe when I make money and I knew I shouldn't have done what I did, that is luck. I know it exists. My ass has been saved many times of, well, doing the wrong thing at the wrong time, but eking my way out of it with a profit. 
And I believe that that goes on a lot in this industry. And you see it thrown up, regurgitated day after day with these people posting their MT4 results. And they're the same individuals that have 20 trades in the same asset. And they're all different prices by maybe one and a half pips difference. $18,000, $20,000 profits on each one of them. They did not take that trade. And the fact that they have all those little entry points, they didn't know what they're doing. They're, they're, they're just going in, placing trades, placing trades, placing trades, and then there it is. I'm telling you, folks, those individuals are not making real money, period. But these are the same people that are going to influence you and tell you, don't use a stop loss. Trade on days where I'm teaching you it's not likely to be that perfect setup that you're looking for. Did you just say perfect? Yes, I did. There's a perfect setup that I have in mind that I hunt every single week. Sometimes I miss it. Sometimes it doesn't form. But in my mind, I have a specific unicorn pattern that I like to see every single week. And I go after that. That's my personal model. I'm not teaching you. It has a lot of the things that I've shared. But your unique unicorn pattern, that little perfect thing that you're looking for, you'll develop that on your own. It might be the very model I gave on YouTube. Or if you're a private membership student, it may be one of the models I taught. Or it might be a hybrid of 12 that I taught. That's where the flexibility has to come in. You have to give yourself the, the flexibility and invitation to bring your own individual uniqueness as a person into your trading. It's fine to take what I've taught conceptually, but you have to still work with that like clay and mold it around your personality. If it doesn't work, it's not because my concepts don't work. It's not because you can't be a profitable trader. It's just because you have not form-fitted it to your personal personality, your way of thinking and engaging. But these types of ideas where I'm teaching that you cannot do something on certain times of the, the calendar week or month, they have to be hard rules, regardless of what you've done in the past, regardless of who you respect in this industry. And they tell you differently. I'm telling you, folks, if you want longevity, this is one of those keys, those secrets to doing it. You have to know when to say no. I don't care how good it looks. You're watching the chart. It's no. Because I can tell you, every time I broke this rule, every single time before I put the trade on, I could justify, oh, it looks good. And as soon as I put the trade on, most of the times I regretted it. But I would stay with it because, well, I committed myself. So I can tell you, statistically, looking back, all the times that were harmful to me, the things that were not positive or profitable, all generally hinge on doing things when the market's really not likely to even give me the setup I'm even looking for. And when I was younger, if I had a setup I was looking for, many times I was impatient with the hell with it. You know, I'm getting tired of waiting. This stochastics didn't get down to oversold quite yet. And I'm just going to get in now because I'm just impatient. I'm tired of waiting. Stupid. And you've probably done things like this before. Everybody that's ever traded with live money has done that before. And many of you probably still do it. You know what you're looking for, a fair value gap after a shift in market structure and a liquidity pool. There are three things that are very, very clear things that you need to see in the chart. If you can't see them, obviously, what are you doing? Gambling. If you feel the impulse to gamble, that is the sure sign for you to get the hell out of there, turn the computer off, and go and leave your house, leave your office, leave your phone, and go do something else. Physically remove yourself from the opportunity to hurt yourself. Do it. I promise you, if you do that over the course of one year, look at how much money you would have saved yourself. That's how you convince yourself of it. But some of you are so new at this, you're not going to believe what I just said applies to you. You're the exception to the rule, and you're not. Believe me. I didn't think my shit stank when I was 20 years old. I thought I figured it out real quick, real fast, and it was like, oh, the golden child. And I had no idea what I was doing. And nobody could have told me these lessons right now, and I never would have listened. And I know that going into this discussion with you, there are some of, especially young men, you're not going to receive this message, and you're just 
putting your fingers in your ears. You're waiting for me to talk about something else. There is nothing else I'm talking about today. This is it. But you need this lesson. You need to know it because if you don't, and if you don't learn it early on, you won't be in this game long. It won't matter because you will remove yourself and you've done it to yourself. It won't be me. It won't be my fault. It won't be my concepts. It won't be somebody else influencing you. It's you. You. Your broker takes orders from you. Everybody else around you may have an influence on you, but still bottom line and responsibility solely rests on you. You can't blame anyone else. You. That's another reason why this industry is difficult. It's so easy, but it's next to impossible. Because everybody wants to have the credit when it works out in their favor. They want to add a boy, add a girl. They want to champion themselves. They want to pony themselves in front of everybody. Look at this. Look what I did. Look how, look how great I am. Put a thumbs up. Like my comment, my post. Retweet me. I've done something excellent today. Take notice of me. Look what I've done today. I have done something that is not. Is that someone that's grounded in what they're doing and they don't need someone else to validate them? No. That's a weak-minded person. That's someone that's a, it's an attention whore. That's what that is. I be, I'm accused of that, <laughs> but I'm not. I, there's a lot of things that I could show you and do that would be the definition of that. I don't need to do those things. What I do is I do just enough to get inspire my students. I'm interested in what you're showing me. That's the exchange here. I teach you. I give you examples to show you what it looks like. And, it can, and then you are to go out there and do it. And then you show me like homework. That's the relationship we have here. I don't do that as attention seeking or clout chasing. You're giving feedback to your mentor. I'm looking for that. I want that. And honestly, I have a lot of user groups in my private mentorship. And I don't have one single user group where one group is just really thriving and they're doing it just like they're, they're afraid. Like they're afraid to be judged by other people in their own group. In a safe, enclosed little area like I have in a private mentorship forum, they should feel safe. They are not. And that tells you something about their psychology, their viewpoint. They're afraid. And you have to conquer that fear. Put it out there. When you send me something on Twitter or if you make a video on YouTube and you send me the link and I, I, I watch a lot of videos as long as they're not really long. I like to see the videos like I create myself, these little vignettes. And you probably hear my stomach growling because I haven't eaten anything. I apologize. But I like that feedback because I, that means I know you're doing the work and you're taking the lessons like this one and you're applying it to yourself. You're applying it to your trading. And when you do those types of things repeatedly, you're going to get the results you're looking for. You're not going to get it on the timeline that you want. That's the problem. You're all subscribing to the fact that, yes, these things work. Yes, I can do it. And you see other people doing it. But you don't want to subscribe to the idea that it's going to take you a year to get really a full, solid understanding of what a calendar year looks like in trading. That's why I tell you it's going to take you about a minimum of a year. You can learn how to trade in a month and a half, two months. You can learn that part of it. But you cannot learn to be a trader anything less than a year. I don't give a shit who tells you. There's a lot of people out there beating their chest that they're the best, they're the goat, they're this and that thing. I don't see their students showing shit. I'm waiting. I'm being real patient before the end of the year. But I'm waiting and I don't see anybody thinking outside the box. <laughs> or profiting in the box. But I could be wrong. We'll see by the end of the year. But these guys out here, they try to influence you. And the only thing I'm trying to do is keep you on the right path. Don't do stupid stuff. Don't take unrealistic risk. Don't expect these models to dance for you when there's no music playing. 
And that's essentially what's being said here. Don't go in immediately after a bank holiday and expect the market to be perfect, symmetrical, everything easy, because it's not likely to be. It can, but it's not likely to be. So don't you really want to focus your time in market environments that are likely to give you gangbuster conditions? That means easy salad day trading. It's just really easy. It's just like low-hanging fruit. The setup's just laid out in front of you. The easy placement of where a stop loss should be logical and where it's likely to go is a draw on liquidity. That's what I teach my students. And guess what, folks? That is not an everyday condition. Just because we call it day trading, it is not everyday trading. You have to grow comfortable with not needing to be doing something today. And you see these jokers, Twitter, Instagram, oh, ICT says he doesn't trade on Mondays. No, I, I can trade on Mondays. I just like to wait and see what Monday does on certain weeks. But they take something I've said in a video or someone repeats and they'll take it to the extreme. Oh, he, he doesn't do this. So therefore he's stupid or he doesn't work and he doesn't have a profitable system and he doesn't do this and he doesn't do that. That's a fool speaking, pretending to know something, have no idea what they're talking about. And again, ask them to show by contrast. Crickets. So don't invite these other people, whether they're critical of me as your mentor or you as my student. Who gives a shit? Who gives a shit? Who cares what any of these people think? Are you going to give this stranger who you will never meet the power, the energy, the time of day to even listen to their bullshit? Many of you, it's like, it's like flypaper and you land on it and you can't get away from it. You love the drama and you're always chasing that drama instead of pouring that energy and time into improving your craft. This is a skill set that you have to work at. You got to keep working at it and you have to filter out all the bullshit. You got to take the negative stuff and keep it at bay. Don't let it in. If I'm a fraud, you'll know it. If this stuff doesn't work, you're going to know it. You don't need somebody else's opinion. You won't need that. You're going to come away with, wow, this shit really works. Or this is bullshit. It doesn't work. This doesn't even hold up. And all I'm asking is people to have a genuine, sincere interest in themselves, not me, in themselves, test drive it. I lay it in your hands for free. I tell you what you have to do, what is likely not to work for you, when not to do something. And if you operate with that in mind, you're still going to lose money, but you're going to see that it works more times than it doesn't. So if it works more times than it doesn't, when doesn't it work? That's the discovery you have to find because it's you bringing that into it. What? What you're saying is, is your method's perfect. The algorithm is perfect. The interpretation that you or me are going to bring to the marketplace that given day or trading session, that's where the error comes in. The market's always right. We are the ones that are incorrect, and we suffer the monetary loss when we are wrong. How hard is that to assume in terms of responsibility? It's something easy, but it's like telling a child, you can't have that lollipop right now. You need to eat dinner first. You have to eat your vegetables. You can't have your pudding until you have your meat. Well, this is one of those lessons that's meat. It's not a milkshake and gumdrops, folks. But this is the stuff that you have to have. It fortifies you. It makes you prepared to endure with this market and any market out there that you're ever going to trade. It's going to give you. Now, think about it. This could be two or three chapters in a book. And you wouldn't want to read these chapters. You'd be going to the parts that have charts and pictures of order blocks and fair value gaps and volume imbalances and bissies and sibbies and all those good things. And all that stuff will still cause you to lose money if you don't listen to things like this. Because you have to have boundaries. You have to have limitations. And limitations are not a bad thing. They're not. 
but you have to be told by someone that operates with them that benefits from them and then you have to test drive that too and it gives you a peace of mind it gives you clarity it gives you confidence a confidence level that you can't really or i can't really articulate because you have to experience it to know how do you know when not to trade trade a specific setup even though it may look like there's an optimal trade entry a fair value gap a shift in market structure it looks like there's relative equal lows above or below the marketplace how do you know not to take those trades how is he able to not be a participant in those moves well it's this but i don't beat around the bush and lie and sugarcoat and say i'm in every move out there because there's a lot of moves that i'm not a participant in that were perfect that just wasn't there to do them or i did it wrong i was looking somewhere else i paid attention to somebody else's opinion about something i go in and look at that's why i don't like following anybody it's not arrogance and last last time i was on twitter i had people say oh look at he's so arrogant he doesn't follow anybody what kind of mentor is that he doesn't follow anybody well i want a mentor that doesn't look for advice in the field that they're trying to be the mentor in because if i'm looking for advice that means i don't have it together i don't know what i'm doing now i'm not saying that everything i do is in you know is perfect and free of imperfection because I'm not perfect. My trading results are not perfect. I have losing trades. I can do it wrong just like anybody else. But that's the human element in me where I'm thinking outside of the rules I've placed in there. And every single time I do it, invariably I regret it. But I don't want to follow anyone else. I don't want to be looking at what they're thinking at because in my mind, and this is going to sound arrogant, but I want you to understand why I do it. If someone shares an idea with me on Twitter, Number one, if you're if you're a student, what you're basically saying is, is if he likes my post about what I think is going to happen in the marketplace, he's really basically giving me a nod saying that's the right way of doing it. And notice that you do that. I don't ever do it. It's not because I don't see you. I see you. It's not because I'm trying to be rude or ignorant. I'm not going to co-sign your trade because what that's going to do is it's going to build this expectation that, OK, I'm going to rub the magic eight ball. I'm going to open up Twitter and I'm going to shake my phone and rub it and ask it, does ICT think that this Euro dollar trade is a good buy right here? Yes. If he comments and says otherwise, it's no. If he doesn't like it, it's no. And I'm probably going to class the trade. <laughs> Some of you are laughing right now because you know damn well that's what you're doing. And I'm not going to like your post. I'm not going to co-sign your trade because guess what it becomes? My trade. And if I can't make money off your trade, <laughs> I don't want to be a part of it. So don't do those things. And you won't feel like I'm ignoring you. And you won't grow with this measure of expectancy that I'm going to be the oracle that co-signs the validity of your trade setup because it's not going to happen like that. I don't do it for my private membership group, and I'm sure as hell not going to do it on Twitter. So... I don't follow anyone, and I don't like when people pose their analysis to me about something that's unfolding because I'm immediately – what I'm doing is – this is what I'm really doing when you do that. I'm going in to see what you're doing wrong, not in the, the position to correct you because the market's going to correct you, and you have to learn that way. It's impossible for me to field every single question that's ever sent to me by email or even on Twitter or my comment section in the videos. Just look at them. There's too many of them. Can't keep up with it. But if I am posed a question with, this is what I'm doing in trade right now, you know, what do you think about that? Or they'll sometimes throw a comment in there like, learn from the best, ICT. <sighs> Listen. <laughs> I don't need that kind of stuff. I appreciate it, but I'm still not going to like your post. I'm not going to high five it. I'm not going to do that because what I'm doing is giving you that little nudge that you're not going to get when you're trading without me around. And that's going to be a day in the future. I don't know when, but it'll happen. And you're going to need to be able to trust yourself. That's the mentor I'm trying to be. I don't want you pushing me above everyone else. I don't want you worshiping me. I don't want you calling me a goat or a king or any of that crap. Be your own king. You want to be a goat? You like being goats and all that stuff? Do you be a goat? I don't want to be a goat. 
I want to be just ICT. And I'm a boring middle-aged guy that is very, very content with being what I am. And I like being what I am. And I'm not going to be influenced to change who I am. And when someone sends me something like that, I go in looking for what they're doing wrong. And sometimes that has caused me to go in and take trades. So I'm fading what you guys are sending me. Now, you don't see those things, even when they are profitable. But that's what, that's what goes on in my head. That's how I'm wired. When I see other people and they show their YouTube channel reviews or whatever, maybe they've taken a trade. Maybe that trade was profitable. I'm going in and comparing what I did that day. And I'm measuring myself against that because that's a character flaw in me. So I have to keep that at bay. And I don't allow it in my teaching. Because if it comes out in my teaching, it's not going to give you any benefit. Because I struggle with it. Because I believe thing better than everyone else. That's, that's my understanding. That's my belief. Okay, Whether anyone else subscribes to that view or not is irrelevant to me because I know what I have and I know what I see and I know what I've been able to work with over the course of my entire life doing all this stuff. But that is also in a person's hands like mine who is obsessively compulsive and a control freak. These are issues that I wrestle with. I'm not going to engage my students like that. Like when I was on Baby Pips, that was me just going, but still teaching. It was a social experiment. I wanted to see, can I basically create the environment that created me? And nobody ever came out of it like I am. I don't have a student that just, you know, transformed into a junior ICT. I don't have anything like that. I have a lady, <clears throat> a woman student rather, that is amazing in trading. And she works with three different models. And I'm telling you, she is so humble and so modest. She, and she's right now, she's wishing I wouldn't even bring her out right now. <laughs> but I'm, in, I'm just impressed. Like I'm impressed what she's been able to do. And she never wants to draw any attention to herself. She never goes out in social media and reps me. She never says anything. And she's extremely modest when she contacts me. So, and this is a woman that trades with lots of real money. Okay. And how many of those types of students do you hear me say I have? Exactly. Most of my students are young guys that have came through. They wanted to do it easy. They wanted to have it real fast. Dollar menu mentorship with Olympic results, gold medal results, because they want to go out in a hurry out in social media and say, look at me, I'm a beast. Look at me, I'm a goat. I'm this and I'm that. Look at me, worship me. And that's why they're struggling. Not because this stuff doesn't work, because they're in a rush to be something they're not intended to be. And I am not creating that. That's not my intent of teaching You know all the things I'm teaching. But I have a lot of profitable students that are quiet about what they're doing. Not many of them are like the lady student I refer to. She's 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 cut from a different cloth. And frankly, she's, you know, it's just a really amazing person, not just in her trading, but just a really nice individual. You would you wouldn't find any negative to say about this woman. She's very humble. She's very soft spoken. But if you saw <laughs> if you saw what you could do, oh, man, like sometimes she's traded better than me. And I don't have any shame in saying that. Like her entry sometimes was better than mine. Her exits were better than mine. And sometimes she traded in a market that I wasn't interested in. And I'm flattered that she calls me her mentor. I'm, I'm blessed and honored that, that the woman is so aware that what she's learned from came from me, but she doesn't elevate me. And that's exactly what I want from all my students. And I love championing her. I wish she'd give me permission. I wish she would give me permission. Because I'm telling you right now, I would have her plastered everywhere. 
And that's what I want my students to be like. My students like that. But she knows that's exactly what I intend to do. So she's, she's telling me no. Because she doesn't want that type of energy around her. But the man in me, the teacher, the guy, the testosterone junkie, okay, I want that. I want to be able to shove that right in the faces of everybody that says you can't learn anything profitable. And from the men that think they're going to be the ones that rule everything, my best student is a woman. Yeah, a lady. And man, I'm telling you what, she's done phenomenally well. She's done very well with articulating what it is that works for her. Not everything resonated with her, but she's found her own way of doing it. And it, it's amazing to see it. The transformation was amazing. And there was nothing special about him when she first came to me. Nothing that stood out as this was going to be the one that really stands out. Nothing. Because it was a soft-spoken person. Just said lots of questions. What do, I, what do I do in this situation? How do I avoid this? I'm afraid of this. How do I conquer that fear? And it's everything I taught on this YouTube channel. Think about that. All the things that was required for her to find her niche in this where I taught for free on this YouTube channel before 2022. Think about that. My best, my best came from what's freely available to you. And I see all these people out there and they're making little videos saying, oh yeah, this is my opinion of ICT. Don't tell me an opinion until you show me that you traded with it. Because if you're not trading with it, then you didn't do enough work to trust it. Ooh, how's that for logic? See, you like to sit on here and critique other YouTubers and you've never really done anything. When they place themselves out there and say, hey, look, this is how I do something and you're welcome to try to test drive it and see if it works for you. That's all I do. And for those individuals that go out and they watch a video or two, oh, yeah, I really didn't do this 2022 mentorship, but this is how I do things differently. I look at it this way. And this is my spin on ICT. Don't even bring my name up. Don't even do that. That's clickbait. Okay. Usually what's going to happen is, is my students are going to come in and rip your comment section apart. Okay. And which means that it sounds like we're a cult and it's not. It's just these are young men and women that are very, very passionate about who they're learning from because they know I'm passionate about them. Who encourages you not to do those types of things? Because not, not only does it look ugly, it looks like I champion that stuff. I don't. I don't, I don't want any of my students to act like that. It's lessons like this I want to hopefully ground you, give you the right perspective, explain why certain things are beneficial for you, and how conditions and environments are going to be harmful to you psychologically, emotionally. And traditionally, it's the men, the young guys in here that get themselves in trouble because they are thinking with an adversarial, like a, a, a gladiator, a, a person that wants to go out there and you know, rattle sabers with the next guy out there. And sometimes it's because they feel like they got to defend me or sometimes they just feel like they want to be a superhero and they want to go out there and challenge the entire world. You are inviting all the wrong kind of energy because here's some folks, just like it was for me, when I was looking at baby pips for, I don't know, it was like a year or so, I was quietly just reading baby pips forums and to listen to the stuff or really read the stuff that was being talked about on there. It's laughable. Like this stuff that was being promoted by people is garbage. It's literally trash, but there was people still working very diligently to try to make those things work and they never were working. So I literally sat, I sat down and said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to, I'm going to do something I said I wasn't going to do anymore. And I'm going to come out and make myself available to people, but I'm going to have to get something out of this. I'm going to have to do a social experiment and see if there is a way that I can kind of create the same atmosphere that I had when I came up. And I want to see if I can create that like a laboratory experiment give them just the right amount of information I had in the order I got it and see if they were able to see what I was able to see. And again, not one person was able to do that. 
but I wanted to be the person to come out there and help other people. But I'm out with something of a chip on my shoulder. I was told not to do something. And remember what I said earlier in the video or this discussion? The sign says, stay off lawn. Don't touch wet paint. When I'm told I'm not supposed to do something, I'm going to look for 17 different ways to do it. That's just the way I'm wired. I'm not saying it's an admirable characteristic. It's many times the real reasons why I have anything negative in my life, because I, I feel like I have to do these types of things. Outwardly, some of you might look at it as, oh, you're attention seeking. No, I think I got to get off my chest. And I have it. I have it where it's very easily disseminated in the world. But I'm told I can't do certain things. So I try the color outside the lines as much as I possibly can. And then I'm told, don't do that. Don't do this. You better not do that. So I backpedal and I look for different ways to go again, a different approach, a different strategy, but gets me very, very close to what I feel is an insatiable desire to share. And when I was teaching for free, I'm teaching for free right now, and I don't want to go back to ever teaching for money. But I had so many people say, you know, he, he only wants to do this for money. Well, I proved that I can make millions of dollars teaching. And I proved that I can put that down because I don't need it. There's a number of individuals out there right now that are teaching. They don't really have a justification for collecting money because what they teach doesn't work and they can't prove they've done anything with it. They, in this situation like I am in, that I am turning away that type of money, they would never even ever, ever entertain that. And why did I do that? Why did I go into the paid mentorship group? Because I know some of this stuff keeps popping up. When I was teaching for free on Baby Pips, and I was doing it a lot, like every day I was putting up something. I loved it. My wife was like, why are you spending so much time with these people? Like, you're, you're spending all that time. What are you getting out of it? Oh, I got a lot out of it. I got, it was a vent. It was an outlet for me to plug into and download everything that's in my head. And I was really actively trying to see if there was going to be an individual out there that could come up like I did. I, I, like I wanted to create that, that Dr. Frankenstein scenario. And I was disappointed that it didn't materialize. Like I, I worked very hard with some individuals on an individual level, and they knew who they are. And some of them actually turned out to be trolls. And that just goes to show that they had the issues, not me, because they were getting hand delivered things down uh, above what I was teaching on Baby Pips and on my YouTube channel early on. But I, I didn't go in with the intent of building an audience to, to sell. I didn't because I could have done that right from Jump Street. I had a million views on my threads. Nobody ever had that many views on Baby Pips. And that's not bragging, folks. I'm just telling you. Think about it. I had the framework to go right into business if I wanted it. But we went to Ocean City one summer. And it was in 2016, actually. And I came back. And I had all these emails from people saying, um, there's a Middle Eastern guy in a company that's taking your free YouTube videos and selling them. And I'm like, what? And I, I just kept reading all these emails. It was like everybody discovered that this was going on. And I honestly, I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna sugarcoat it. I was fucking pissed off. I got pissed off. It lit a fire under my ass. Like you son of a bitch, watch this. You want to do something like that? Okay, no problem. Instantly, I told my wife. I said, I'm about to do something that's probably going to change a lot of people's opinion about me. But if I don't do this, I'm going to lose my mind. So I went right to Twitter. I said, I am not going to teach anything ever again for free. You've been selling my stuff. If anybody's going to collect money on it, I am. And I put the PayPal link up. In 24 hours, I had $80,000.
24 hours at eighty thousand dollars and it just came in wave after wave after wave after wave now when my wife saw that she was like wow this is you know without any advertising at all i was like yeah it's crazy i never advertised and i got all kinds of threats and i knew i was right over my target because why are they going to buy anything from anybody else when the real McCoy is doing it? And that's how I grew. It was not by any fraud. Everything I've done, I've done in front of people. I've said, this is where the market's going to go. This is what it's going to do. This is why it should work. And this is why people were in my mentorship and stayed. The ones that couldn't do it, couldn't afford it, or they found someone leaking it and selling it to them for cheaper. And that's the reality of it, folks. And no matter what I do, someone's going to be out there trying to twist it and make a, a way for them to make money with it that wouldn't be in agreement with me. It's like anything. Pay-per-view events, they, <laughs> they they make their little channels on, it used to be like Periscope and um, I can't think of the other thing that, uh, you know what I'm talking about. When people, they can't afford to pay the live event like it's a boxing event or something like that. Somebody will put it up there and say, hey, just you know, tip me five bucks and you can watch it from my stream. It doesn't matter. I mean, that's always going to go on. I'm not going to be the exception to that. And if I'm a hot commodity, which in trading in Forex and such, I am. And I'm not beating my chest, but I did this with the intent of doing it for free forever. But I got pissed off. I did it. And then I said, well, you know, I'm not going to advertise. And I did say I'm going to do it and close it. And then I had all these other people saying, hey, let's join, let's join, let's join. I want to join. You didn't give me the opportunity. And for a few years, it just, I felt bad. So I opened it up and I finally said, this is it. Cause it's become, it's become too many people. I can't, I, I can't even manage having any more people than I already have. It's next to impossible to manage. And I'm going to tell you the truth. This is the, this is the truth folks. Okay. listen to me. This is why you can trust. I am never, ever, 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 ever putting that PayPal link out there and saying, join my mentorship again, because I can't give the level of service on an individual basis. Like some of my students already want and they expect in new damn well, they would never be able to get that from me. You can't, nobody has enough time in the day to be able to do that. Let's just say you had 500 students and I have shit tons more than that. Let's say you had 500 students and all of them are emailing you two or three quay. And believe me, that's low end. How much time do you have in a day doing everything else you do as a husband or a wife, a father, an employee? Because most of you probably have a job or if you have a business or if you're in school. How much time do you have to sit down and just 1,500 replies? Now, you're not just open right away giving a reply. You got to listen to them. You got to read it. You got to figure out where they're coming from in an articulated manner of response to them that is going to be meaningful and useful to them. Now, do that with hundreds of thousands of people. Think about that. Do you know anybody that could easily sit down and say, yeah, that's accomplished with this, that, and the other thing? I could do that. I could have a team of people. And it still wouldn't help me because the brain trust is me. I can't. I can't give the responsibility of answering their questions to someone else. So I can tell you this, this is the reality of it all. They are part of a community that I outlined beforehand where I think the market's gonna go. That's the only benefit that they have. You cannot join that. In the YouTube on the mentorship stuff that I'm doing on YouTube, that's for free. I'm teaching you what it is that I use to give them that insight. They have already been taught that. But the advantage is, is I'm co-signing before it happens. I tell them where it's going. Now, a lot of you want that, but I'm telling you, you don't need it. You don't need that. There's a lot of people that wishes they didn't join my paid mentorship and knew I was going to do what I was doing right now. Because they wouldn't have spent the money and it would be a, a lot easier for them to be lazy and say, well, at least I didn't pay for it and I could just do it whenever I want to. And it's there on YouTube. You're not going to hear a mentor talk like that about their own service, but I'm honest. But I'm also that same mentor that could easily come in there and start making millions of dollars every single month. 
yeah, month. And I don't want it. I don't need it. And it doesn't motivate me. What motivates me is the people that are still listening. You. That didn't turn off. Because you want to listen and learn. Because you know there's something different about me. I love what I'm doing. I'm not getting paid to do this. There's no ads playing. There's no pop-up saying, skip this video in five seconds. I love this. I love doing it. I care about your results. And I know I'm never going to meet you. But I know that the students that are really resonating with what I'm doing, your life is going to change in a way that you can't even imagine. And it's not just going to be for trading. It's going to give you self-control over yourself. It's going to give you a means of focusing on a task and seeing it through, sticking to it and understanding there's going to be hard. There's going to be problems that come up, unexpected twists of events that doesn't really help the cause that you're trying to go after. But you endure it. And you grow from it. And when things do happen outside of what your expectations were, you don't go in with a negative mindset of beat yourself up about, oh, I wish I would have done this. Oh, I wish I would have done that. Oh, I wish this wouldn't have happened to me. It's, this is what happened. What can I take away from that for learning experience? And how do I prevent and mitigate it from ever occurring to this level again? That is how you live. That's life. Life is not promising you ease. And just because you're learning from me, I am not promising you you're going to have profitability that's going to come to you easily. There are some of you that right now feel strongly about what you're learning, and yet you still will fail. And I'm not going to pull that punch. I'm not trying to sell you the books. I'm not trying to sell you a future mentorship. I'm not trying to sell you a subscription on my YouTube channel. And I don't care if you follow me here. I'm being honest with you. But those same individuals, that would encounter that failure. You can change that too, but you have to put work into it and you have to put the work that nobody wants to talk about in their courses. They just want you to believe in their bullshit, subscribe into their worship session. And you have to be your own cheerleader. So if you want to worship somebody and cheerlead on somebody and raise somebody's name up, do it when you feel like you need it. And guess what? There ain't nothing wrong with that, folks. You got to preach to yourself sometimes. You got to say, you know what? This is hard. And guess what? If it was easy, everybody else would be doing it. But I deserve this. I'm working towards this. It ain't going to be gifted to me. It ain't going to just fall into my lap. I'm earning this. So nobody can talk bad about what I'm doing. I'm working towards it. Just like a college degree, like a master's degree, like a doctorate. You're going to be, I don't know what you're trying to be. And some of you are in school. That's admirable. The, the tenacity that's required to stick with that is admirable. But in this, it's got to be even more than that. See, in this, it's not just tuition and trying to get the passing grade. It's survival here. And when you don't survive, it weighs heavily. It's not like, oh, I'll go to college. I went to college. I want the things I'm supposed to do to become a systems analyst in computer programming. And I did all that. I had really high math, really high science. And I was advanced as a child because I was pouring myself into these things before school would ever consider it. In sixth grade, I was making my own video games with basic, you know, the language. I stayed after school. And stayed in my math teacher's classroom to work on coding because I wanted to be better than everybody else. And nobody else wanted to do what I was doing in class. But I wanted to be on the computers every opportunity I could. And I cut grass. I saved up money. And I got my own personal computer. And that's what I was doing. When everybody else was playing football and playing baseball and doing soccer and all the other stuff that normal kids would do, I was in there coding. Now, I didn't know anything about the markets then, but that's where I was. That's how I've been. So I've been different. And I'm a mentor that could be making, mil I could be making millions of dollars every single month doing what I've been doing for six years. And I want you to just take a 
take a step back and listen. Who else would do that? I'm not trying to virtue signal. I'm not trying to say, look at me. I'm the goat because I'm doing that. I want you to understand what my motivations are. And don't lose sight of what I've been telling everybody. Shit is about to get really hard. And I don't feel comfortable saying, you know what? You're going to need to make more money and different ways of making money. It's going to get hard. Here, pay me and I'll teach you how to do that. That's disingenuous. But because I'm willing to do that doesn't entitle you to the same level of analysis that my private group gets. The beforehand, they earned that because they trusted me and they paid for it, frankly. Here, I do way above what would be reasonable and expected in terms of free education. And I love doing works. Look around. There's people that are doing all these things that are now making money. They're not solicited. I don't pay these people to do that. I don't have any affiliate relationship with any of these funded accounts. And believe me, they'll tell you if you ask them. Because some of them reach out to me all the time. Hey, can you? No, I'm not. I'm not repping any of you. Just sit back. My students will probably be using your service and then they can rep you. What other mentor, let me say it this way because I gotta be careful. What other concepts do you see all these funded account people getting their accounts and then getting withdrawals? What other concepts do you see outside of mine? They may have their own little twist of their name and but they're teaching my stuff, but they're learning what I have authored. Now, I don't like how they did it, but the students that have done well, I'm happy for them. The people that are trying to get credit for themselves, like they learned it on their own, they're the ones I have an issue with because they're doing it all the wrong ways. And I understand they're trying to kind of they have a hustle, but their hustle their hustle is really flawed because they're really not going to have the credit once people wake up to who they are and what they're doing. They'll start smacking them around and they, they don't care. They want that fast money right now. But the people that are learning. What it is that I've released into the world, that stuff that's making them real money, you can't argue against that. There's a lot of people out there teaching all kinds of stuff. But where's the proof that this stuff works? That was the proof I've always wanted. I wanted that proof. I want to be that mentor. I don't want to be the person that says, oh, the, you know, I make lots of money because I've taught. No, I'm the mentor you want to have because I'm not going to lie to you about how be for you, all of you, but I'm also the mentor that's going to be able to say, I could be getting rich off of you, but I don't want to. And in my eyes, coming up the way I did, that's the person I would have latched onto. That's the person I would say, you know what? I may not agree with everything they say. I may not agree with their delivery method. He may not say the things I want to hear, but I know what he's saying is impactful. He endured something. He learned from that. So I might not feel that it's applicable right now in my own development, but I know it's noteworthy because he is talking about it. And now I'm talking about it a lot longer than I wanted to when I first sat down with this space. If you were here with me one-on-one -on -one, like I was doing in the 90s, this is exactly what the majority of the time was going to be like. This is it. Not one of those individuals ever sat up and said, you know what? I got to go. This was a waste. This was the things that they leaned on afterwards when they started engaging, pushing a button. These are the things they said, you know what? That conversation we had about this or that conversation, and that, that session we had about that, that really came to fruition and resonated with me today because I leaned on that logic because I needed it. And I can't imagine how I would have been able to endure had it not took place and I was a participant in that conversation. See, I'm talking to my children right now. You just had the benefit of thinking I'm talking to you. My children. That's what this message is for. So when I talk to them, I absolutely love them enough to pour everything I have about knowing what they should and shouldn't do. And that's why it's genuine to you because it's meant to be genuine. It's real. I'm doing this out of love. 
but you have the benefit of being permitted to listen to it. That's why I'm different. That's why when you listen to me, I sound sincere because I am. My audience is my children. All those videos I made on YouTube, all the videos I made in mentorship, they're not for you. They're for them. And I say it multiple times throughout the years I've been doing it. But that's why it feels like I'm talking to you. And it feels like we have a relationship like that because you are coming to me with an expectation. You want to be taught and you want me to care about your results. I do. As a student, I want you to do very, very well. But have in mind also that when I'm speaking, I have my children's faces in mind. I'm talking sometimes to one specific child about certain things that they're wrestling with or I know they're about to wrestle with. I'm going after that in our, in our conversation. Well, it's not really a conversation, but <laughs> the jaw burning session like this. So I understand the unique position I'm in. I'm not oblivious to how some of you can take that out of context and lift me up as a hero or look at me as someone that's not worth having the attention placed on. I don't care either way. I don't like when I'm worshipped, but I don't care when people disagree with what I say and don't think I teach appropriate things. But you have to know where are your boundaries. I know where mine are. Do you know where yours are? I know that this morning wasn't going to give me the conditions that would be the ideal model conditions. And I'll leave it up to you to discern whether or not it was offering very clean, symmetrical price action. Sure, market's gyrated around, it's moved around, done all kinds of things. But has it done what this model calls for? No. Should you be upset about that? Some students would be. ICT, you said this repeats every day. It, it repeats every day in some asset. It's there every single day. But your market might not be the market it creates the setup in. And you have to know that it's fine. It'll come when it's supposed to. But here's the wonderful thing. I didn't fall victim to anything today because I have a rule. After bank holidays, I watch, I observe. Is the market still booking price in the manner I would expect? Dollar went higher, so does the S&P sell off? Not so much. And after it ran up initially, yeah. But it has yet to take out that 3740 level. That's my interest. That's the level I'm interested in this week. How's that useful? Well, if I don't have a setup come Wednesday, 7 o'clock in the morning, I have to pull all interest in taking any trades. That's how I operate. Doesn't mean it won't pan out. It won't, like it won't deliver on Thursday or maybe even Wednesday afternoon. That would be a missed opportunity for me. I'm okay with that you're probably not going to have that comfort or willingness to say, okay, I missed that move. You'll probably go crazy because it went down to 3740 on a level that was obvious and was framework was there, but that's not a trade I would take because it's outside the rules that I've placed on myself for this particular week, non-farm payroll week. Why do I operate like this? Because Thursday and going into Friday, non-farm payroll release at 830, the market can be very choppy, aimless, and just do things that are uncharacteristic to what it is I'm looking for in price action. So if I know that these climates in the economic calendar for that particular week every single month are likely to bring those adversities, why would I want to risk money in that when I know there's times when it's not like that? And I'm looking for those in, in instances where the market's almost inviting me. Hey, look, I'm going to do that thing you're used to saying. Come over here and get this. Versus, what the hell's going on? Why is it doing that when it should be doing this? All right, I'm going to arm wrestle you. That was 20-year-old ICT. It was an invitation to go out into the arena, bring my sword, leave my, my shield. Because <laughs> I was better than the average bear. I don't need to worry about defending myself. It was just get out there and buy it and expect limit up moves. And blue ribbon results. And then I was the one being carried out. 
on a stretcher. <laughs> Every single time I was like that, that's what was the result. So you either live long enough to learn the lessons and be better because of it, or it takes you out of the game entirely. And I was fortunate enough to not ever want to lose my passion for this. And even though I had early on adversities that would have otherwise took the average person out of this and interest completely remove it, I still wouldn't let go of it. And I think that's the reason why the Lord gave me obsessive compulsive. Because if I didn't have that, I don't think I would have stayed in this. Like it would have been too painful for me to endure all the times where I lost my accounts, even doing it to myself as a 20 year old, I would have never had the, the wherewithal to stay with it. I would have given it up way earlier than the dozens of times I said I was going to quit, but really was just me saving up money to get another account started. So there's a lot of lessons that, you know, an experienced individual can give you, but they're going to be in the flavor that isn't going to be the most palatable when you're young or new because you feel like they're not going to be useful to you until you start losing money. And then you're going to want to know the answers to those questions that are very pressing at that time. How do I stop the hemorrhaging? How do I stop myself from doing this to myself? See, many of you have never even traded outside of a demo yet. You don't even know what that feels like yet. Your first trade is going to be full of heart palpitations. Your palms are going to be sweating. And it doesn't matter how little of risk you're putting on. It's real now. It's a report card that none of you want to get the results for. You're scared. What if your first trade's a losing trade? How embarrassing will that be? <laughs> Every single time I've ever opened an account since I was 20 some years old, I purposely throw the first trade. I just do something just to put it on there and then I close it after it puts a, a loss in. I do that. You know why I do that? It cancels out the necessity for me to be perfect. I'm sure that sounds silly in some of your ears. It's, well, why the hell would you want to do that? Because that's something I have to do. Or I will wrestle with perfection. So if I start a new account, say I open up with a broker. I open up and all of a sudden, boom. You know, I'm ready to go in there. I'm starting to trade. The first thing I do is throw one trade. I just toss it in. And that completely discharges my ego. It completely discharges my expectation on myself. And it frees me up to just focus on what it is I'm doing it for. Not, I can't have a losing first trade. I don't even worry about it. I make it to the first trade of the losing trade. There it is, done. I have mastered my ego by doing that very one thing. Whenever, whenever I start a new month, I do the same thing. Why? It's a rule for me. Now, I'm not saying I'm losing thousands and thousands of dollars, but I am taking a loss. And it's something I want to do because it sets me up in the right mindset that perfection is unrealistic. So if I can take that loss, knowing I'm going into it, taking that losing trade, guess what that's doing? It's reminding me that this business is all about managing losing trades because every single trade is a losing trade until you close it in profit. When you open up a trade, you're under the spread. You're underneath the commissions. You got to come out of that. You have to trade your way out of every trade because they're all losing trades. Very, very rarely do you ever get in a trade right away from entry to no drawdown whatsoever. They happen. But largely, majority of them are going to be, you got to overcome some kind of initial under the water type threshold, whether it be cost by commission or spread or initial drawdown from the entry. So one of the most freeing things I could have done for myself as a young man was give myself permission to do that very thing. And I got the idea from George Angel, which is also the guy that taught me that if I don't have a real good feel for the marketplace, but I know that the market's going to be moving. And I'm just a little unsure about my bias or I don't have a bias, but I'm expecting a lot of volatility for that day because a report's coming out, something to that effect. I will just put on a small position. I'll just toss something in the water and see how I react to that. If I put a short on, for instance, and back then in the 90s, you know, to say I, I went in and I put two contracts short. Okay. I'm watching 
to see how do I feel in that trade? Do I feel confident it's going to move in my favor or am I starting to feel like it's going to go against me and, and widen the loss? And that immediately gets me in alignment with the marketplace. Some of you would never even think to do that because you think that's wasted money. No, no, no. I'm just paying a premium for Intel. When I first read that in his books, I was like, the hell is this guy smoking? You're telling me you're putting real money in the markets, knowing that you don't know what the hell you're doing. And you're just going to get a feel for what's going on. Look, I can do that by watching price. You can't. You cannot. It, it's not the same. You have a perspective that is much more meaningful when you put something on the line. And for instance, say you trade in Forex. Put in the smallest leverage that your broker will permit you to do. And see how much insight it gives you. Stop thinking about that MT4 screenshot being blue only. It, it doesn't matter if you have a little bit of red in here and there. What matters is, are you hemorrhaging money when you're losing it? Or are they controlled losses? Are those losses inside the boundaries that you've outlined for them? You have to have boundaries. In every asset and facet of trading, the way you engage, the way you think, why you're doing something, why you're not going to be doing something, what prevents you from engaging a certain way or a certain time of the day or calendar week. And when you have those rules, stick to them. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks about them. You have to adhere to them. When you're driving your car, how often do you have to go over the other side of the road? Make it a practice to do it all the time, right? Hopefully. How about drinking and driving? Do you make it a practice to get up every morning and have to go to work and drive to work? Hopefully not. Speeding. I'm guilty of this one. So I'm going to be real careful how I say this one. But how many times do you want to go over the speed of 100 mile an hour? Probably not very often. But I can tell you it's on occasion happened. But <laughs> I'm being honest, folks. Those rules are there for our protection and everyone else's protection. But your broker is not there to protect you. I'm not going to be there to save you. Your spouse isn't going to help you. Your children aren't going to certainly do anything to get you out of a bad situation. And those people in that chat room that you think are your friends, they don't give a shit about you or your results. They don't care. They don't care, folks. They're in there to get a withdrawal from all of you around them. They're not in there depositing anything good. They're in there to fluff themselves up or to cope. They're in there to get a dose of copium because they're losing. And they want to be around other people that they can see are losing too. And they can talk down to you, even if it sounds like they're doing something admirable and saying, oh, don't worry, stick to it. Stick to it. You'll, be, you'll, do, you'll do better. Meanwhile, they're blowing out their account. They're between accounts. They don't have money to back in an account. But they're giving you advice. I know what they're doing. And you might feel, oh, this person's really nice. He talks to me or she talks to me and encourages me. This person's probably a losing trader. That's why I got rooms. That's why I don't like Discord rooms. That's why I don't like all those types of things because they feed negatively. It doesn't give you a benefit of being there. Now, there are times where there are individuals that are genuinely interested in helping other people and they're showing their prowess. They're calling a move. They outline a move. They explain what's going on, why it should take place. If you're in an environment where it's like that and you don't have the opinions of others also, like if it's a free for all, everybody can talk, then I think that's a bad place for you to be. But if you're amongst someone that has a skill set that they're showcasing and they're walking you through the marketplace and they're proving prowess, then that's not a wasted environment. That's something that could be beneficial to you. But unfortunately, there isn't a whole lot of that going on. And they do exist, but largely it's not like that. Usually it's some kind of a forum where everybody can chit chat. And I know when you're new, because this is what I thought too, I'm going to say this, I'm going to close the, um, this session. When I was on America Online, I would join so many message boards and forums you know, online because I was looking for that person 
that I am today. And I never found them. So I couldn't find them, so I became the person I was looking for. When you join these chat rooms, you're thinking that someone's going to be very nice and help you out. And they're going to do it out of the kindness of their heart. And I never found that to be true. I got the same regurgitated crap advice that in all the books I wasted the money on. I stopped buying books. 2016 books. I never, ever, ever bought another financial book after that one. That was it. Done. The books I say that are beneficial, I put on a video on my YouTube channel. That's it. They're the only ones. And I have just about every book you're going to ever come up with, until, unless it was released after 2016. I probably have it. And I've read some of them multiple times. And most mostly it's because it's sentimental value that I went through that crap. But if someone stole them from me, I wouldn't care. Would I buy the books that I mentioned on my YouTube channel again if my books were stolen? Yes. I think they're valuable. I think there's useful information in them. There is no book out there that's going to give you everything. There isn't an author out there that's going to give you all the pieces. And I try to teach with that mindset. I try to cover everything. And a lot of that is going to be the things that you don't feel are valuable right now. Managing losing trades, how to avoid market trading environments that aren't going to be favorable because you're wired to think what? Go, 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 baby. Push the button, push the button, push the button. Well, I believe I'm better than the average bear. But if I go in every single day wanting to just simply push the button, I'm not going to have the results that I want and that would wise be expected of someone in my position. So hopefully in the closing of this Twitter space, you can see why I would be talking about these types of things because it's important for you to know where your limitations should be, why it's beneficial for you to not want to do something every single day because it's more profitable to do that. If you can avoid the times when you're likely to have adverse results, you are ahead of the game. And I mean across the board because everybody has a way of making money. You can make money with Elliott Wave. You can make money with supply and demand. You can make money with black box garbage, okay? Shark patterns and bat patterns and all this other nonsense. There's always a gimmick that you can use to justify why you made money. But nobody has a system where it says, avoid this. Our daily life has all of that. One way, don't enter. Wrong way, speed limit. Here's the yellow line, don't cross it. If it's dashed, you can cross it. But if it's double solid line, don't cross it. No U-turns here. Are you cussing at every sign? You probably do when you need to make a U-turn. <laughs> or if you're in a hurry and you know that sign's just suggesting that's probably the safest speed to go into, but you're not worried about that because you're late for work. Because you didn't do something beforehand. You stayed up too late. You colored outside the lines. You broke your rules. You didn't set the alarm. You didn't make sure that alarm was set for why it happens. And you have to have a way of mitigating those circumstances in trading, preventing the opportunity for ma majority of your losses. You're going to lose, but the times where you're going to blow your account are going to be in times where you knew damn well you should not have done that, and you want to fix it right away because you don't want to go home with a losing trade. And then you parlay that little boo-boo, that little mistake, into something that completely blows your account. I can tell you, every single time I blew an account, they always were on the heels of one little boo-boo that I wish I wouldn't have done, and I tried to fix it, and that became a paper cut into an open wound that even stitches couldn't even handle. So I'll leave it up to you whether you decide this was a beneficial space or not. It's not a feel-good moment. It's not a discussion that is a 
happy one. It doesn't make you feel empowered. It makes you take inventory. Are you doing things? Are you thinking correctly? And are you avoiding when you're likely to lose? Until next time, be safe.